Hey everyone, welcome to the Wild and Uncut podcast brought to you by Ruger. I'm your host, Christy Titus. Thank you for tuning in. The line is going hot, so let's go full send on this episode. In a world where rugged and reliable matters, Ruger stands strong. Celebrating 75 years of American-made craftsmanship, Ruger continues to set the standard for excellence in firearms. From the iconic 1022 to the American rifle and beyond, each firearm embodies precision engineering and our deep-rooted traditions. Join us in honoring a legacy built on strength, innovation, and the American spirit. Hey everybody, thank you for tuning in for this episode of the Wild and Uncut Podcast. I'm your host, Christy Titus, and I'm here with the one and only Jessica Byers. If you guys live on social media like I do, you will <laughs> find her handle at follow her arrow and i'm sure you guys have seen everything that she does she's uh currently working with hunt and full magazine so you guys have probably seen a lot of stuff with her doing public land hunting she's an avid bow hunter elk hunter um and you guys a lot of things going on in your life right now and um like <gasps> great intro though you have so, <laughs> yeah. so much to introduce. I'm like, where do I even start? Thank you for welcoming that de- <laughs> breath of fresh air, this yeah. deep breathing. That's my my uh, motto lately. Just keep breathing. Just keep swimming because yeah. it's a bit chaotic, but in all the right ways. Yeah. I'm very, very grateful for the opportunity and the curveballs that happen because it's life. Yeah. And uh, I know you know a lot about that. Oh, man. So. Amen. Preach a sister. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like, like, I don't think there's anything in life that's consistent other than change. I, I would agree. Yeah. Yeah. And learning to embrace that and push into the fear that naturally comes with change is, yeah. whoo, it's a, it's a daily struggle, but it's like, it's exciting. It's this weird, like butterflies, but what does the future hold? And I think when you dream big, yeah. that's just, it goes hand in hand. So, yeah, we just went through a dream big phase where, um, you know, I went to a, a hunt in Wyoming and I, I fell in love with the state and I called my family and I was like, we have to move. And I'd lived in Oregon my whole life. And within six months, we had moved. I'd sold my house. Talk about leap of faith. Like, uprooted my parents, their company, their staff. I moved. My husband moved. Like, we, I mean, it's like, leap of faith, right? But then, but when you know when it feels, it just feels right. And that's what's really cool. Because not, a lot of times change feels uncertain. When it feels right, you're like, this is it. I don't know what's going to happen, but I know that this is this is what's next for me. And it's, yeah. there's something comforting in the chaos yeah. about it. And that that's, I'm living it right now. So, yeah. so do you yeah. want to elaborate on that a little? Or? Yeah, sure. So uh, I've been at, I moved from Texas. I'm Texas born and raised. Uh, never thought I'd leave Texas. But you don't have an accent. So I really appreciate that about you. <laughs> like you're not when, like, oh. when I go back home, it, it comes it can, back. Yeah. It creeps back in. Yes. Okay. And I still say words that aren't actually words, but it's gotten much better. Yeah. So thank you. I try really hard. Um, yes. Born and raised in the South. Um, never thought I'd leave Texas. In fact, I still say if Texas had mountains, I'd have never left. So, um, but I, I fell in love with the mountains, actually elk hunting for the very first time. Changed my life in 2015. Always knew Was I Was that went, in Oregon? New Mexico. Okay. So I have a story about that. And I have to tell it on this podcast. I've never told anybody about it. And it involves you. Um, no, I know. I know the story in the red pants. What? what? We're talking about okay, two, different two different things. things. Never mind. We okay. have more stories All still. Right. Okay. So, um, yeah. So I fell in love with the mountains. I always said I wanted to move to the mountains one day. And so when the opportunity to work for Huntful came up, and I just fell in love with Huntful as a company, I thought, you know, there's so much opportunity out there that people don't know about. And people need to know. And... Um, growing up hunting so much private land and like not truly knowing what's out there is a little, a little, little timid to yeah. branch into the public land, you know, thing. Uh, it just opened up so many things for me and it taught me a lot. And so made the jump. I've been at Hunt and Full since November, 2019. Um, That's I a love, long time. Yeah. Over yeah. four years, I just bought a house in Southern Utah. Uh, I love my team and I still believe in the brand a hundred percent. 
but sometimes life throws you curveballs. <laughs> so, uh, quick summarization: I was in Hawaii for Rihanna's wedding. I'm sitting in the makeup chair, and I get a text from the owner of Montana Knife Company, Josh, and he's like, "Would you ever move to Montana?" And literally, the only thing I could write back was, "Damn it, Josh," <laughs> because yeah. I felt like I was just getting my life settled. You know, I bought a house, yeah. and I'm like, "This is where I want to plant my roots," which was scary to say when I love the south like yeah. i love the culture of the south and families in the south but i n i know that i'm meant for the mountains and um starting to feel like my life is starting to get settled in my mid-30s and then bam psych <laughs> and i should have you know as much as i love my company and my team and my job i'm like i should have i should have hesitated yeah but i didn't no and i think that when you have opportunity like that that comes up you have to go with your gut when mm -hmm. you're just you just have to be in it like well, what does my gut say um and I knew right then I needed to entertain it. So it's been a little bit of a, a journey, mm -hmm. like just the whole process. You know, I was very adamant about I don't want to leave Hunt and Full in the trade show season. I, I want to stick with them through the trade show season. So it's been going on since early December, but um, officially gave my notice um, beginning of January. Mm -hmm. So you're and moving so, to Montana. So I'm moving to Montana. Where in Montana? Uh, Frenchtown, where the headquarters oh, is. Oh, it's Frenchtown's beautiful. It's yeah. just north of uh, Missoula. Missoula, yeah. And uh, you don't have to deal with that terrible traffic, like, because you're on the right side of town. So that's yeah. a good thing. Yeah, everybody says, well, that's perfect. You'll be near the airport, yeah. and that's where Costco and Target and everything is. So if yeah. you do need to move, go to town, at least you're close to everything. Um, yeah, I mean, I think Missoula is a cool city. I've been there several times. Yeah. Would I want to live in the heart of it? No. Probably not. Um, I think the thing I'm most excited about is becoming a Montana resident mm -hmm. because it's so interesting to work for a company currently that it's all about opportunity and getting in the field. And if you're a resident of Utah, you I'm don't sorry. Have a lot of opportunity. <laughs> like you're, yeah, you just don't. I mean, yeah. I'm thankful to run, you know, chase cows and spikes every year for you know less than a hundred bucks. That's nice because you don't get that everywhere. But outside of that, there's just not a ton of opportunity. Yeah. So. And again, thankfully, I work for a company that's like shows you how to get out of your state to hunt, and it's centrally located, which is nice. But I'm excited to take advantage of what Montana has to offer, yeah. and I sh I will be a resident because I'm starting into February. I'll be a resident by elk season, so I'm pretty excited. So you're gonna <laughs> kick off your next this coming archery elk season as a Montana resident, which is I will. supremely awesome. Yeah. And um, yeah, that uh, that's exciting. Big change. Are you gonna buy? What are you thinking? I'm actually renting Josh's property next to him so he mm -hmm. bought his neighbor's house i'm gonna rent that for a year yeah. just i don't i didn't want to spend too much time trying to find a place i just want to feel settled i can walk to work yeah i've got six acres over and then backs up to public land he said you can hear elk off you know your back porch sometimes yeah, there, so and you, there's pretty good white tail deer hunting in that valley right there really yeah yeah okay. I've, I've shot a white tail in that valley not too far from there so nice there is some you can kill some deer and shed horn yeah. hunt and some spots out there and actually it's an interesting zone right there where you can hunt mule deer and white tail depending on the time of year and um, but there's some really cool late season white tail opportunities there um, nice yeah so i'll have, have to pick time. your brain it's i fun. didn't even know i haven't do i haven't like mm -hmm. truly like dove into all the opportunity yeah. i am excited to be in really good bear hunting country mm -hmm. Um, I've been skunked a couple years now for hunting bears in, yeah. in Montana. I've had a shot at one. It just didn't pan out, but, um, yeah. That's hunting. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'll still be a non-resident, but I'll be in good bear hunting country. Yeah. So I'll go ahead and get a tag and try to. You need to talk to Jana Waller. I know. I, so she knows she did. She also messaged me like yeah, you, you did. Need to, you, need to invest, <laughs> you need to call Jana. Yeah. So. And she'll then, tell you where to go for bears. Yeah. I'm pumped. I, uh. Yeah, the future is yeah, exciting. How so, exciting. and there's so much opportunity for residents of Montana, like so much opportunity yeah. that I don't even think I, I don't think I even fully know all the opportunity because we, again, we approach everything from a non-resident perspective. Yeah. So, yeah, that's I why mean, we moved to Wyoming. Is yeah, we well, we always say Wyoming is the number one state to live in for resident opportunity. Montana would be close number second. Two. Yeah, some people will say Idaho maybe too, but like. Yeah, just those three, you're, mm -hmm. you got good hunting opportunity. Trifecta of good hunting. And yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, especially having, for me, having mules, Wyoming is like, that's the place. How many do you have? Uh, <laughs> I keep buying them. <laughs> it's an addiction. <laughs> um, well, I mean, it's necess like necessity also. Um, but currently, we have 10. Um, so I have eight mules and two horses. Nice. So 10, but we're not, we're on a lockdown on animal purchases. I'm done. Done. Y'all agree on it though. 
Yeah, we're, we have a good number. I ended up, I bought two mules in December and I was only gonna buy one and then the, the mule kind of came with a bonus mule. <laughs> and she's awesome, she's a 21 year old like endurance champion yeah. and she's big and strong and um you know we're just gonna give her a good you know last 10 12 years of her life and she can slow down the pace and not have to race and just you know hike the hills with me and she'll be a great addition super sweet and um I, i've been really fortunate the last three meals we've bought are all older and gosh they're so awesome so far so we're really stoked in the heart of the wilderness, every step counts. No matter where or what you're hunting, Onyx Hunt Elite has you covered in the U.S. and Canada with offline capability, land ownership, 3D mapping, and you can even access specialty courses, hunt research tools, and elite-specific features. No matter where you pursue the wild, adventure is assured when you upgrade to Elite for the ultimate hunting experience. And so 2023 was the first uh, season that you were in Wyoming as a resident, right? As a resident, yeah. The year before, we did what we called the cash-out season. So I cashed out all of my Oregon resident points and my Wyoming non-resident points. Okay. So I hunted both states. So Good for you. We were going back and forth between the two states, and it was an insane insane time frame like it's so much travel going back and mm -hmm. forth but we pulled it off we had a great season la uh, the year before last so last year was our first year as residents um and had a great season i um as a wyoming resident i might have been a little I, I was pretty picky i'm like okay i've seen the bulls that are here and i can bow hunt and then turn around and rifle hunt yeah and so i didn't notch a tag this year on elk my dad killed a really old bull um but i just like yeah, you're a four-year-old bull. We just, uh. we just, I walked from, I don't even know. It's going to be a great episode for this year because I walked from, I don't even know how many elk. Like countless, I mean, not literally, but. I still haven't got yeah. to hunt Wyoming. Yeah. I put in last year, I had four points. I put in for a special tag, just for, or general tag, special license. Yeah. This is the last year before they bumped it up. And I didn't draw a general tag. Yeah. I'm like, this no, it's is like, it's like five years crazy. So, and then I'm not even going to try to draw. Just with the transition of getting a new job, yeah, I'm trying to plan. like, hey, like. Yeah tone it down a little bit and I already you know I always dedicate half my September to my dad and um, we meet in New Mexico every year like it's it will forever be an annual father-daughter hunt yeah. until he's not here anymore and, yeah. or until we can't yeah, have, yeah. until we don't have the opportunity right because opportunities are constantly stripped from us but I dedicate that to him we started elk hunting together and I just nothing is more important than that amen so. to that and I feel the same way like my dad and I that's what my dad lives for he doesn't hunt a lot, like, but he bow hunts every year. Yep. And he's getting better about coming and doing more hunting, but archery elk is his deal. And It's the same for my dad. He lives on a property with whitetail everywhere, pigs, coyotes, everything. And he's just In like... In Texas. Yeah, and he's yeah. like, I'm just not that mad at him. Mm -hmm. I'm like, well, management is still very relevant here. Yeah. <laughs> like, we still need to manage it, but... I, it's, you know, archery elk hunting is the only thing I can get him to leave Texas yeah. for. So, it's well, pretty special. I mean, if you love where you live... Yeah. I mean, that's what, it, like, for me, I moved to Wyoming, so I don't have to leave a lot. Because <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm, we're traveling so much, it's nice to just have roots, you know, yeah. and be like, oh, I get to go hunt with my best friends, the mules, and my dad and my husband. So it's not yeah. like, it's like I'm with my family year-round now, and I, like, it's so, like, fulfilling for me in my soul. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, but. Totally uh, get it. Yeah. So talk about your, um, your Western hunting journey. Like, there's a lot of people that are coming from a place that, like you, Texas or the East Coast or Midwest that want to be a mountain hunter. What kind of sparked that for you? My dad. Mm -hmm. So I, my dad always had me in the field when I was younger and he was super patient with me. He always exposed me to the outdoors. He waited till I was ready and I told him, hey dad, I think I want to shoot a deer. It's like one of the highlights. I will never forget his face when I finally told him I was ready to pull the trigger. Um, so we started that whole hunting journey yeah. together. But then I, in 2015, I was getting married and he said, well, for your wedding present, would you want to go elk hunting? I've always wanted to go elk hunting. Would you want to do that? And I'm like, sure. Christy, I didn't even know, like, what a, I didn't even know what a bugle was. Yeah. All I knew was my dad's asking me if I want to go. Tra so traveling's always been a passion of mine. I've traveled all over the world since I was young. Even though he never liked to leave, that's my mama and me. Mm -hmm. Like, I love traveling. So I've been a lot of places, but not to hunt. And so the idea of getting to leave my roots with my dad yeah. to do something new to chase the biggest animal I've ever you know seen yeah. before it was like 
Yeah. So cool. And I didn't know the opportunity in front of me when it came up, honestly. Like, now that I know what I know about New Mexico, I really didn't know the gift that he gave me until later down the road. But It's a life-changing, though. And that's... It is. That's the, that's the gift, is it changed your life. It changed the trajectory of your life. A hundred percent. And so he said, would you want to go on elk hunt for your wedding gift? And I'm like, yeah, let's do it. <laughs> and again, I didn't know anything. <laughs> and uh, anyway, I ended up, he... He missed a couple bulls that year. I think only a couple. Bless his heart. He had a he had a, a rough streak. He went seven years, seven seasons without connecting. He finally did, but um, not for lack of effort. It uh, happens. Yeah. I mean, we had a we had a strikeout season last year, so I <laughs> yeah yeah. And um, I call it first timers luck, but I ended up getting a bull that year. And again, to go from never hunted out of Texas, didn't know what a bull sounded like, never been in close to one. To connecting with my bow was just, uh, I don't know, it gives me chills even mm. thinking about it. And again, I didn't know how how big and how pivotal that moment would be until later down the road. But I just knew, I'm like, I want to do this for the rest of my life. That's what I was certain of. Yeah. Um, it gave me confidence that I'd never felt before, truly never felt before. And in a world that it can be difficult to find that, yeah. it's so important for a young girl to find that in herself. So the outdoors gives me a lot of that. Bow hunting does that, but bow hunting elk is just life. It's, ev- it's everything. Yeah. It was so cool. Um, so anyway, that's kind of where my story with, like when I said, I wanted to tell a story about you connects. Cause I didn't know, again, I wasn't trying to get into the outdoor industry. I like to hunt period. That's all I knew. And I wasn't a big, you know, Western big game hunter, but that was a, so that was an outfitted hunt. And, the outfit that I went with has hunted with you before. And I remember being in the blind. So I, when I shot my bull, I was by myself. But prior to that, I had been with someone every day. And he brought you up in the blind because I said, I think it'd be so fun to do this all the time. Like, I just love this. It's all I want to do. And he's like, well, there's lots of ways to do it. Just, you know, do it conservatively. Do it the right way. And I was like, well, what do you mean? He's like, just make sure you're not, you know, some girls get out there and they just show all their skin and do all that. But don't do that. I'm like, oh, no, I'm conservative. I'm good. I'm not worried about that. And he goes, you know who you should look at is Chrissy Titus. Oh, that's so sweet. She did it the right way. And she got into calling. She found a passion for it. She's really good at it. And she kept winning. And people started looking at her, and they looked at her for the right reasons. Mm-hmm. And I just wanted to, I've never told that's you really that or sweet. talked about no, it, but I, I think no it's idea. important that you know that because of you are a such a good example. Thank you in the world i mean obviously in the outdoor industry and in hunting but like in the world and how you carry yourself um yeah Thank i just you. wanted you to know that's, so that's i, I so heard your sweet. name my first year elk hunting Aww. when everything i don't know who that was but thank you his name is roger roger okay yeah, yeah. that's awesome that's yeah. really sweet yeah so that's when i first heard about you that's so funny and he brought up elk, the elk calling contest yeah. and all that yeah. and yeah i still am you know i don't compete in that i Number one, I don't practice that much to be competitive, and you—it's like an it's instrument. <laughs> like, I ain't got time to practice to be that good, um, but I have fun doing it. So I do. Like last year, I hosted the contest and um, with Elk Foundation, and like I still am super passionate about it. And yeah, yeah, just love it. Love elk hunting and calling, and there. Well, anytime you can go and you can speak to an animal and have it answer you and talk to it and know what it's doing, and it's pretty. It's life changing. It is. Yeah, like it super is. life changing. Yeah, the the night that that night when I had, um, ended up killing my that first bull, I hadn't heard a bugle all day. They just said, if you sit on this tank all day long, because yeah. they weren't talking. It yeah. was first first archery season in New Mexico it was brutal, and they weren't talking. We weren't seeing them, and they're like, "This is your last hurrah." Like. And I sat there for 15 hours. I went in super early because it's public land, and I wanted to beat everybody yeah. to getting there. And um, and I did, and I sat in that brush behind forever. And when I finally did hear a, the bull coming in with all his cows, I thought I was hallucinating. <laughs> I, I hadn't been eating or, like, drinking a lot because I didn't want to get out of the blind. I had to go to the bathroom. So I was, like, being super conservative about everything. Like, total Texas hunter, just white tail hunter, just sitting in there, like, don't beat, don't move, don't do anything. And Elk are a lot more forgiving with that. They're so, <laughs> like, Dude, completely different. After I got my first arrow in him, because I waited till he was wading out of the water and I got my first arrow in him. I just needed to gauge like his belly to the top of his back. Because again, this giant animal, all I knew was white tail before then. And so as soon as I could see where, where I needed to place it, I shot. He jumped out and he came up to the bank and stood there. And I'm like, 
all this brush is in the way because I'm in a brushed in yeah. blind. I army crawled out of the blind, knocked another arrow and put a second arrow in him to put him down. That's awesome. And the fact that I could do that 20 yards away yeah. and him not be alert, I was like, He's also this sick. is not a white tail. Yeah, no. <laughs> He's also sick. Yeah. He'd yeah. already been shot once. So, um, yeah, it was, it was amazing. And so anyway, so back to your original question. Um, that was a turning point in my life where I knew this is what I love. This is what I dream about. Yeah. It made me, it like, um, awakened even, I love writing. And so it made me just open up this world of wanting to write and share adventures. And it's such a therapeutic thing for me to write yeah. about everything, like all my adventures and stuff. And, um, so we kept going back and just, uh, that was our annual father daughter hunt. And then I ended up hunting in Colorado. Um, my buddy, he's a firefighter. He's, you know, has a really flexible schedule. He's like, would you ever, he's like, I don't know anybody else who'd want to pack in. Who's crazy. His words, who's crazy enough to pack into the wilderness for three weeks on horseback on horses that we don't own. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, let's, let's do, it. do it. And so I didn't get anything on that trip again. Cause I was super, I was such a rookie and all I had ever experienced was outfitted hunts on as far as elk. And, um, this was completely DIY, a zero point unit. And I'm like, let's just go have fun. And yeah. we camped for three weeks and got close every day and didn't get one. But I would say that that was equally as pivotal for me because I didn't have anybody to lean on. Yeah. You know, we split up and hunt separate a lot and it taught me a lot about myself and all my weaknesses. I think that's the coolest thing about hunting is that it exposes strength and strengths yeah. and weaknesses and then gives you like a, a, a never ending goal mm -hmm. to work towards. So, mm -hmm. um, and then, yeah, I just built on that. And then eventually hunt and full came around four years later I felt extremely unqualified. Ah! <laughs> I'm like, I'm from the South. Are you sure you want to hire a Texas girl? But, you know, I, you don't know what you don't know. And I don't think it's fair to compare passion from someone who has experience versus doesn't have experience. Like, how bad do you want it at the end yeah. of the day? And I knew that I had that. Mm -hmm. If I didn't know, I didn't have all the answers. I wasn't the best hunter. Um, I certainly didn't understand Western, uh, all the different point systems and everything. But I knew I had the heart for it. And, and you're smart and capable. Thank you. And I am so grateful for them giving me an opportunity for that mm -hmm. job and for taking the chance of finally leaving Texas mm -hmm. when it's all I ever knew. You know, it's still at my heart. That's that's home for me. So I love how humble you are because like there's nothing that humbles you more than hunting, especially <laughs> bow hunting. Um, yeah. And by the time you think that you're like some super badass, like the mountain will will knock you down and it'll wreck you it'll show you you know and every year you know I think it's really important that you learn whether it's getting better at shooting a bow or a rifle or practicing your calling skills or whatever like there's always something to make yourself better or more competitive whether it's fitness I mean and that's the other thing like I love following you you do a lot with fitness and you're really open book about your struggles with fitness and my, i love that my and my, my I, really I crappy did. crossfit form well you are so cute you're like i started 75 hard i did it for three days okay <laughs> i did but i did finish All it right. once too did, yeah no but that was really impressive though that you're like okay how many people would be like i made it three days and i uh, uh, but you were honest and transparent and we're only human a hundred percent yeah so yeah. i really I really uh, am inspired by that too. Like you're like, okay, I'm really trying to do these things so I can be better. Yeah. Talk about your fit fitness struggles for some of our listeners too and viewers. <laughs> yeah. So I grew up, I played soccer for 10 years. So I was a cardio junkie. I'm not like, I hated running, but I loved soccer. You hated running, but you could play soccer. That's I, sprinting, I guess. <laughs> I know. Like that's yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't match up quite. Okay. Uh, okay. Um, but no, I was on a traveling team for 10 years and I went to a tiny little two a Texas town, right? So we didn't have a soccer team at the time. Um, I couldn't play school sports and travel soccer. So I didn't get all the like weightlifting. Mm. I had never touched a barbell until three or, or two years ago, two and a half years ago when I started CrossFit. Um, weights were like totally foreign. I mean, I've had like touched a couple of dumbbells and boot, you know, and boot camp and stuff. Like really, I say dumb, like 10 pound dumbbells, yeah. you know, nothing that's really pushing me the yeah. way that I'm pushed now. And it was just always run, 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 cardio, cardio, cardio. Um, and elk hunting also taught me that you better have some muscle on your bones. Yeah. You gotta be strong <laughs> to carry them back. So, uh, that's another way that hunting has changed my life is like, I want to get to the top of that mountain, 
but my thighs and my butt are on fire right now <laughs> and I don't have anything to keep me going. Yeah. So super motivating. Like it really made me realize it made me parallel our bodies to a vehicle. Like if mm. your tank is empty, you cannot perform it. Yeah. It's not going to go. Mm-hmm. Um, I wasn't scared of food. I, I, um, I don't have, I don't think I have an unhealthy relationship with food, but I do con- like, I don't, I've never been a calorie counter. I don't look at the scale. I don't, nothing like that. But I do question like is this good or bad and there's so many people that say like this food is good this food is bad I'm like it's really a personal journey and it has been for me I deal with hypoglycemia I deal with like um just circulation issues in general like everything always cold I'm always cold I have Raynaud's yeah me too it's miserable yeah I'm always cold and um it like I'm I'm just now getting Raynaud's my mom has it really bad so I'm just now starting to get it get tingles and and yeah. numbness yeah. and um, it's like all right people are like why are you always cold I'm like I don't know like I was at SCI last week literally walking on the show floor shivering yeah like I could it was pretty chilly in Nashville yeah. though like yeah. that was a that was a little bit of a bite chilly show um so it's been a mix of food you know for my whole all growing up both my parents are tall and slim like I could eat whatever I wanted and I was running all the time mm-hmm. so you know but you can't gain muscle I have just as hard as hard a time gaining muscle as someone who's trying to lose weight Wait. like it is a constant battle and I have to eat and eat and eat and eat the right things so that's a that, protein yeah that part of my journey has been the most difficult mm-hmm. because the weight side of it I instantly saw my um the way I even like walked and like how my body aligned and everything started to change when I joined CrossFit because of the heavy weight pushing mm-hmm. myself and you can't do the, f- it's a functional fitness. It's, you can't do the movements without proper core strength Correct. and how everything connects. And I just love that. I think it's really applicable to the mountains, yeah. you know, um, and how it all works together. And so, um, and you're not just doing one or the other. It's a combination of dynamic movements. Yeah. Like when people say, you know, well, to carry a heavy pack, you have to train your legs. I'm like, you also better be training your core yeah. to be able to balance that when you're mm, over going over big rocks and stuff. Mm-hmm. And like, I just, you can tweak your back so easily. Mm-hmm. Like how are you going to get up off the, off the ground with a heavy pack if you have a crappy core or, mm-hmm. you know, like not a strong core. So, um, yeah, that, those are two big, I guess, journeys for me in the last several, like mm-hmm. three, four years. Basically when I came to Utah and I started tra- training in the mountains for the mountains, it was like, all right, you got a wake up call here. Yeah. Like you got a lot of work to do. So I started rucking a lot. I was super grateful to have a trail. I mean, I do currently, but I won't for very long. I have a trail less than 10 minutes away. Oh, there's great trails in where you're going though. Yeah. Climbs The Missoula fast. M. Okay. That will crush you. It's so steep. I mean, there's a million people there, but it's a great trail. And then there's, there's running trails. Like, um, you, you need to link up with Steve Decker's wife, Rhonda, and she'll, She'll show, show me the way to go. Okay. Yeah. She's, but she's a runner. Yeah. Okay. I'm not, I, I'm not a runner anymore. I was in runner. one, in one, in my other life. <laughs> but she could give you ideas on where to go to find trails because the M is a great workout. Like it's straight up, like you zigzag and then you can go past the M to the top. And I mean, it's, it's, I love doing it. Like when I used to go to, to Missoula a lot, I did the M almost every morning. It's, it's so funny. It's called the M because the trail I'm referring to is called the C for Cedar, oh, that's so <laughs> Cedar funny. City. So um it's and we live at 6000 elevation and it climbs fairly quickly mm-hmm. so i'm able I'm able, able to tr- um train at higher elevation which yeah. i think has helped, helped me you a ton. tremendously yeah. in the mountains um you don't have to have that training mask on to like inhibit do you think that oxygen? works no i don't think so don't i'm think not a, i'm not a i mean i i've never bought into the concept of it right me so. neither i've yeah I, me neither i just everybody I it just restricts your breathing <laughs> I know. You want to be miserable? Suffocate yourself in the gym. (laughs) (laughs) This is what it's going to feel like. I don't know if it actually helps your VO2 max or not. It got a a lot of traffic for a while. For a while. Like it was like a, yeah, it was kind of a, like a phase, like a trend. Yeah. I never did it. So when I say I don't think it works, it's not because it's not from personal experience. I'm just saying the science behind it. And I, I don't know. I, I know when you go to, when you go somewhere with a higher elevation, it just, it just takes a couple of days. Like, yeah. just be in it a couple of days and you'll be fine. Well, when you go super, super high elevation, they take you to elevation and make you just sit in camp for a day. Yeah. And, like, you're not, you don't, you're not active. You have to just 
get acclimated and yes. then ask your body like you do it in baby steps right and tra any training is baby steps like um yeah like i'm just now getting like i told my husband this morning i'm like man i don't know if i felt this good well it's been years like i'm lifting every day doing dynamic movements picking up heavy weight and i can do it every day it is so empowering and it's like you look amazing yes! by the way thank you, you i've been amazing. it's been a year a year long journey and it's not been easy and um but i feel so good right now and and like healthy and i feel strong again and like that is it's a lot for me because man i was in rough shape there for a little while and you know was it um just lots of change in your life was I got it married i <laughs> i went from oh i just met my husband at the time we were dating i was like i'm gonna do a bodybuilding show this year because i'm gonna be 40 and i want to be in the best shape of my life and he's like no here's some cheese and wine and i never drank before i got married alcohol like it was like my rule I never drank. I had a midnight rule at trade shows. I was very, very strict with myself because mm -hmm. I did competitive bodybuilding for mm -hmm. years. And then when we got married, I just went on like a three year fun journey where I ate all the food in Europe. And I ate all the food here. A I, food bender. Yeah. I love I it. I drank all the alcohol and I just really did it all. And I felt really bad mm -hmm. at the end of it. And I was like, this is not worth it. And so. I just, I haven't drank in a year and cleaned up everything and, and man, I, I feel good. Like I lifted this morning. I lifted yesterday. I'm lifting, I'm almost every day and I, it, it feels so good to feel strong. Yeah. Oh, I'm happy and for you. You're like, oh, I can see this little muscle here. Yeah. And I'm yeah. Like, Ooh, what's that? Where have you been? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> nice to see you. <laughs> yeah. No, I get it. Yeah. It's crazy to me how. Um, I've had a lot of gut issues and so, and everything I think starts in your gut too. Like, are you even oh, absorbing yeah. the things that you're putting in your body? Well, I wasn't. And so I've been through this whole, like this last year has been all about figuring out what triggers me taking huge food panels and figuring out like, why is it that when I eat so well, you know, society's idea of eating clean is like grilled chicken, broccoli, some rice, like, like super just plain Low fat. Yeah. And I'm like, I need fat. My yeah. brain doesn't function without it. Mm -hmm. I need a ton of protein. It's okay to like the way your food tastes. Yeah. Um, but the other thing is a lot of the vegetables I was eating were wrecking my gut. Yeah. I have a sensitivity to vegetables. And there's a lot of people that believe that vegetables are toxic anyway. Yeah. Which is they, really they, an interesting <laughs> dynamic to think about. If you, everybody, you hear your whole life eat vegetables and then there's like this whole new dichotomy now that's like, oh, vegetables are toxic, you know? It's yeah. Like, that they right, like... Right they let off some type of whatever to defend yeah. themselves exactly. in, in the wild. I'm exactly. like, this is so crazy and so fascinating. Anyway, I just think that you can't take one thing and apply it and make yeah. some blanket statement for the yeah. world. Um, cause like I said, I'm hypoglycemic. So I actually, they want me eating really high protein, really high fat and doing like carb cycling. Mm -hmm. Right. And knowing like, if you're going to eat carbs, make sure you're active that day. Yeah. If you're having a rest day or just not Have moving that a lower a lot, carb day. Yeah. And your body doesn't need the glucose. It makes, exactly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, because my glucose is like, whoa, like it spikes like crazy unless I use it. And again, it just goes back to anything. Give it fuel, the right type of fuel, and use it in the right mm -hmm. way that it's meant to be used. Mm -hmm. It's pretty simple, but it's taking me, it's taken me so long yeah. to really, not, not only like be open to the idea of it, because after, again, for so many years I was able to eat whatever I wanted, but. Um, I hate you, actually. But just, I want to put that out. <laughs> hey, listen. Like, listen, I was, I was... You're like, I'm so skinny. No, okay, I will no, say it's called you. skinny fat. Yeah. I, my mom touched my arm one time, and she's like, it was squishy. I mean, it looked skinny, but it was squishy. And she's like, honey, you're you you're fragile. And when she told me that, I was like a flip switch. I'm like, I yeah. never want to be fragile. Well, because then when you're fragile like that when you're young, when you get old and you fall, it's... It's scary. It, well, it's it can cause death. I yeah. mean, that's... That's what happens, yeah. Yeah. And especially after you hit 40, your muscle just diminishes. So mm -hmm. you have to spend your 30s really building a solid foundation of muscle. And yeah. and then when you get to your 40s like me, I'm in my mid-40s now, I'm doing everything I can to grow and preserve muscle. And it's yeah. it's an uphill battle. Like yeah. once you hit mid-40s, it's just... It goes. And, and that's, I mean, that's everything. Muscle management is everything as we age and maintaining muscle management. And then we go into hormones and all this other. Oh, Ooh. so the gut health has also been hormone too. Yeah. Like figuring out how I would, my energy was tanking. I, I'm like, I went to this. So 
I'm a little granola in this way, but I went to a holistic doctor. I'm like, I don't want to be on meds. I want to talk about my panels. I want you to tell me, like, I want to know what the root is all this. Like, I have the discipline to do it. Just tell me, like, let's figure this out. And that's when he did the food panel and tested all my hormones. And I'm like, what's wild is... Were you low on B12? I was low on everything. So are you getting injections monthly? No, I do. So he put me on a low-dose testosterone. Yeah. Uh, I'm on that, too. Are you doing a pellet? Trochies that melt under your tongue. Oh, I do a pellet. Like a compound. Okay. Um... Because we're trying to, because if you do the pellet, it, that's fine if you know exactly how much you need. I just couldn't know. I didn't know exactly how much I needed. We needed, a, this is kind of new in the last six months or so, so we're still testing it. I think the pellets would be more appropriate for me once I figure out what's my, like, what's my ideal yeah. amount. We're still adjusting. Because the trochies, I can, I can cut up and yeah. take them different times. But um, my vitamin D Low. was like, I think he said it was a 12 like at, and now it's a 78. Yeah. He's like, your vitamin D, he put me on a stupid high Which amount for four really months. Helped, you know, it was one of the big preventers of COVID was vitamin D. I if, know. If, you, know if you, you probably had COVID. I did. Yeah. I just had it two weeks ago too. Oh. <laughs> I got, or a well, week and a half. I had yeah. it in Nashville. Yeah. I got it in Nashville. It was brutal. Um, but yeah, I, my vitamin D was awful. And he's like, no wonder you can't keep your eyes open. Yeah, you're tired. You know, between, between the glucose spikes yeah. that I wasn't didn't know what was happening yeah. so I was my sh- I was tanking after like, having these sugar crashes because I didn't know that rice would seriously spike me beyond oh, anything oh gosh yeah that's if you do especially when you don't balance your carbohydrate with meat and fat and learning how like the even the order of how you eat things yeah I never knew that like something just such simple tweaks that have changed my life but again it's a journey you can't do it all no. at once and everybody's different everybody's different and so yeah so we put me on testosterone proge- a little bit of progesterone and then my vitamin D. Um, he checked my thyroid, which was a little uneasy at yeah. first. Mine's now on it's the good. Side, but it's they haven't treated it's, it. Yeah. yeah. So and you can't do it all at once because no. you don't know what. Otherwise, you're not staggering them enough to know and be able to evaluate and pivot. That's you right. know. So being locked in and saying, okay, this isn't going to be some f- you know fast instant gratification thing, which is the world we live in. Ugh, yeah. Um, I like committing to the long haul. I mm-hmm. like you know when I don't want to show up to the gym and I'm lifting, I'm like. But I freaking showed up, and this is a part of my journey, and this mm-hmm. is what it takes. It's just like baby steps that add up. Um, it's been it's been really cool. It's yeah, it's definitely changed my life for the better. But yeah. I'm with you. I mean, when I was younger, I drank. I well, I was opposite in this way. I drank a lot. Um, had severe inflammation, like my joints yeah. hurt, and you just all the things. I didn't know that alcohol was causing that because you just I was in college, and I was having a good yeah. time and you're young and <laughs> yeah and I can bounce back yeah uh I just don't enjoy it anymore mm-hmm. like I you know I don't know and there is a kind of a wave of of people around me and even just across social media that I've connected with that are kind of in that time in their life too and I love it I'm like mm-hmm. okay so you don't have to be you don't have to drink to be cool no <laughs> I think it's cool to not drink yeah <laughs> I I I went through the entire trade show season this year not one drink and um, not no shame in it. And people that know me know that I didn't used to drink. Yeah. And um, then when they saw me drink for a couple of years, they're like, "Whoa, who are you?" And I'm like, "Well, I'm married, so I felt safe because my my being in the industry, my concern was always if I had alcohol in my life, I'd lose my inhibitions and make bad decisions, mm-hmm. and those decisions would affect and impact my future. Mm-hmm. And so I was a massive control freak about it. Plus, my history of bodybuilding and fitness and nutrition and And I just never let myself do it. And then I drank for, you know, a few years. And then now I'm, like, back on it. And and nobody even really blinks an eye because they're like, oh, Christy's back. Yeah, (laughs) just normal. She's off of her little food and alcohol vacation, and she's back to normal. And (laughs) and this is – and my husband's great. He doesn't care. He drinks. She's – he had a bottle of wine last night at dinner. I didn't have any wine. Like, and I don't feel like I'm not as fun. I'm probably not as fun. (laughs) I'm like, let's be honest. I'm probably not as fun as I used to be. But But you're still fun in your own way. I'm fun in my own way. I'm not as wild as, like, if I – Everybody gets pretty wild and lose inhibition when they drink, but yeah. um, but I just feel so much better. Like I was at I was at SCI, and you know we had went from sheep to shot to SCI, boom, boom, boom. Not really a break in between, just straight through. And at the last day, I was like, man, I can't imagine like how I would feel if I had alcohol in my life. Like I would feel awful. And a lot of people quit drinking because they are, have a drinking problem. My sure. problem was that drinking made me fat and I felt horrible. So that is a problem. Yeah. You know, no, and I, so I just quit. 
Well, that that was a, was another reason I I mean so alcoholism, drug addicts run yeah. rampant through my family. Yeah. So uh, that's another reason I was like I just don't need you know I don't have a problem. I know that I've verified that, but you can create a problem you can create a problem <laughs> so very easily so yeah i mean especially, especially when you get home from work and the first thing you think about is a drink yeah like that everybody has their vice though that starts that's like okay maybe i should probably go to the gym yeah yeah i'd rather be <laughs> addicted know. to something else because yeah. i do think everybody has their vice what is it right like for me f- food is a lot of that like i love good food like yeah. local homemade like I just love that. Um, not processed junk food or sodas or anything like that, but like just good quality food. Yeah. I lived in Europe for a semester. I studied abroad. I lived in Italy and um, that really woke me up to like how broken our food system is here. Yeah. The <laughs> European food is so different than here. It's so they good. They don't have corn syrup in anything. And it we dyes, have it in everything. And yeah. 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 We, we put, and even our shampoo. Like, they, we have stuff in our shampoo that they don't have there. I like know. Like, we have, we put stuff in everything that makes it just bad. Yeah. <laughs> like, they don't sell Splenda in Europe. And oh, really? I, I didn't know that. I'm addicted to Splenda. I do not like the taste of Truvia. I am a Splenda junkie. Like, I I will die on the cross with Splenda. Like, I love it. Okay. I, it might be bad for me, but it is my thing. Okay. <laughs> and, um... I will literally now go to Costco and get one of those big Splendas and put it in my suitcase and bring it to our house in Europe oh, because funny. you can't get it there. That's so right? interesting. It's, I didn't know that. No. And, and I'm like, what is in this <laughs> that I probably shouldn't be eating? Yeah. But I'm eating it anyway. Yeah. No, everything's yeah. just so fresh. And I love that even if, even in like the uh, less fortunate like neighborhoods and parts of town, they ate good food. Yeah. They ate quality food. Yeah. Well, and everybody doesn't have like a giant refrigerator Mm -hmm. where they can go buy a ton of food and then let it go bad. Everybody has these teeny tiny refrigerators. So you go to the market more often. And they have gardens. And they have, well. The ones I have. Yeah. It depends where they're at. Yeah. Um, But yeah, you buy locally more frequently. And I think that also drives you to buy and pick up produce and cook with more fresh when you're not buying in bulk. and, And then like a week goes by and you're like, oh, these strawberries are no good I'm not going to eat it you know what I mean I feel like when you're more frequent purchasing you're more inclined to to pick up something fresh sure and I also love the community that resulted from that too of like everybody like selling each other yeah you know fruits and vegetables and going to the farmer's market or whatever I don't know just a different time in my life and I've always appreciated that about that side of the world well and I think Missoula you'll be happy because there's a lot of that if you want to call it hippie culture quote unquote. I'm here for it. <laughs> um, that there's a lot of that hippie culture there in Missoula where there is a lot of local vor, local grown or sustainably harvest food that you can source locally in, in markets and stuff. And I love that. Like, that's great. Um, in Sheridan, they have a little market. I've actually never been because they always have it when I'm not home. <laughs> Because I'm never home. So I go to, and I hate to say this, but I'm a Walmart shopper. Yeah. And uh, that's just, that's just life, right? Hey, you whatever, buy, whatever works. where you go, right? It, it's better than a drive through Yeah. Yeah. That's not, I don't, I'm not a fast food Me neither. consumer really. Now there is a Cafe Rio here in Salt Lake mm-hmm. and my husband will be getting that for me for lunch today because <laughs> I love myself a pork salad. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> but like apart from that, like I'm not a fast food eater. Like I don't, we don't eat that stuff at our house. Yeah. If I ever go through a drive through I always look at my husband and I'm like, here's my cancer for today. Like I just own it. Like if yeah. I'm going to eat it, I'm going to own what it's doing to my body. And then I feel a little bit better. I'm like, okay, at least I'm not delusional. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like this is just... I'm going to eat this and I'm not going to shame myself for it. It's no. just do it and move on. Um, I think that's the key with anything is having balance and being realistic t- with the fact that like you do travel a lot. Yeah. You're going to have to eat some things sometimes that aren't, you know, ideal. Yeah. But so for you, one of the things that I saw you go through as you came up in the industry um, was social media bullying. <laughs> yeah. And people <laughs> were mean. And I remember sitting back and watching, and, and I have this on my pages, don't get me wrong, because I wear makeup. Apparently men really have a really big problem with makeup for whatever reason. Um, so I get that on my pages, but I saw people, um, and I think this, uh, the only reason I bring this up, because I think it's relevant to a lot of girls that are watching our podcast, that sure. okay, are having body issues or um, might be seeing you online and seeing your success and not realizing perhaps 
some of the the valleys some of the, some of the struggles that you've had to overcome to keep your head high and your chin up and, and say okay this is where I belong this is my passion this is my space and regardless of what you say I'm here and I'm here to stay yeah and um, I really want to commend you for that because like people are are horrible creatures yeah they're brutal um it's been it's been a journey so because again growing up in texas and it so it's so interesting and in the things that they do find to pick apart too yeah. that's always just like so bizarre to me um but i grew up in back then was a really small town and if people were talking about you it was probably to your face yeah <laughs> and you dealt with it that way you know um social media was is you know like I didn't get a cell phone till beginning of high school yeah. you know things were just delayed it's, it's the world is just different now and everybody has this way of like um feeling powerful behind this device that I didn't grow up with and again if somebody had something to say they say it to your face so this world of social media was really hard for me to adapt to um and I never wanted to believe that people were that awful yeah like I could take some of the worst people, you know, that you see on the news and stuff, and I'd still be like, there's got to be somewhere in them that's good. One little tick of something. And there's She's a- nicer than me. Yeah. I'm like, no, you're just an awful trash bag. <laughs> yeah. Like, <laughs> like no. <laughs> I know. I, I want to see the good in people, and I want people to see the good in themselves. And so when I see people being horrible, and then it's directed at me, I'm like, whoa. But it's usually, it's, it, they're projecting right like onto you what they really see in themselves they are but I was I was not mature n- enough to, to know, know that. that you know I was too young and I was too new to it and so then I felt attacked for feeling confident in the things that I had accomplished even if they weren't as outstanding as someone who had been in this space for a long time and what I mean by that is well I'll give you a perfect example um, you know, I mentioned earlier that when I killed my first elk, I felt a level of confidence I'd never felt before. I felt like a badass. Yeah. I did. I did. And I've, this is an internal battle I've had many times over the years of like, why am I made to feel so bad now about a moment that made me feel so, so good? good? Even though it was guided, even though I didn't know what a bugle sounded like, even though I'd never hunted out of Texas. Mm-hmm. Even though I'd never hunted public land, why is their first instinct to, to strip me, you. to strip me of something that made me feel so good? Yeah. You know, and the only thing I could, to, to make it an extreme example of that, I see it in Texas where, um, you know, obviously there's high fence operations everywhere in Texas. Yeah. I've grown, I've hunted tons of them. It's not the only thing I ever hunted. I've hunted a lot of both, but um, I've seen a lot of really, really young kids and then much older adults who can't get around in the mountains and they just still want to hunt and they go there and they find they feel so good when they notch a tag. Yeah. Even though it doesn't do anything for me anymore, you know, I'm not too good for it. I just I love the mountain hunting yeah. so much more. But how low do I have to go to tell a kid you didn't accomplish anything. You're hunting on a high fence property over a feeder. You're yeah. not anything. And You're there's on people online land. that are trolls that are saying these things. That's what they say. Yeah. And I will say this till I die. The only reason I am as confident as I am behind a bow is because I grew up in Texas hunting over bait. Mm-hmm. And I mean that because the more things that you, it sounds bad, but the more things that you kill, the more reps in the red zone, however you want to lay it out there, you gain more confidence with which with each clean shot. Yeah. And I got a lot of clean shots before I took that to the mountains and killed my first elk. I don't think I would have killed an elk in a blind by myself if I hadn't had so many shots on other animals mm-hmm. before. It would have been too much. It yeah. would have been like sensory overload. Mm-hmm. And I understand why. I understand why people freeze when an elk comes screaming in and they've never killed anything in their life. Yeah. Like, So anyway, I say all this of, you know, Everybody has their own journey, and I don't think it's fair to strip someone of an accomplishment or of a moment that made them feel so good because it wasn't as impressive to you. Mm-hmm. Um, and even to say that, now I've done all the things that they said I could never do, and they still hate me. And yeah. so that tells me is, y'all just 
y'all just don't want to like me and that's yeah. okay. I don't like everybody either, yeah. but I'm not going to bully you. Yeah. What, um, did, what advice would you give? Like, was there anybody that gave you like super advice that stuck with you? There are a lot of Americans that understand the value of hunting, but we all know that right now, national support of hunting is extremely volatile. It seems that with every passing day, our voice is diminished and the court of public opinion is not effectively hearing our side. We need advocates working on our behalf in Washington, D.C. to defend our freedom to hunt. And thankfully, when we need it the most, we have that advocate in Safari Club International. SCI's world headquarters are located in Washington, D.C., just blocks from the United States Capitol, which means that SCI is on the ground with our congressional leaders and federal agencies on our behalf, on behalf of the hunting community. SCI has an active political presence in all 50 states through their extensive chapter network and government affairs staff. If you have ever wondered why you should be a member of SCI, you shouldn't wonder anymore. Join us in the fight to defend hunting. Go to safariclub.org to learn more. Uh, I don't know if it's like the best advice because, well, I think it's important to, I think it's really important to take a break when you need a break. Mm -hmm. When that becomes overwhelming and you start questioning your, yourself because of what people are saying about you, mm -hmm. it might be time to take a break from social media. Yeah. And I've done it. Um, like I, I, I took my account down for a month or two in the summer last year. Um, I just get sick of it sometimes. And, and I don't, I don't, I don't have any contracts that I have to be super active anymore. Like I was back then. Um, but knowing when something, I don't, I don't mean get off social media and quit hunting, right? I just mean go do, go hunt and go do, do whatever you, you go do you and take a break from being exposed to those bullies. Cause they're mm -hmm. not going away. No, They're going to be there and they're going to be sitting around waiting for the next chance when you do come back on. And I knew that when I got back on again, people also get bored talking about the same thing over and over again. They find something else to talk about. Mm -hmm. You become old news, so it won't last. Yeah. You'll get, like, it's significantly died off for me, and I don't know if that's because I I didn't get out of the space. I, I think, I don't know, maybe people just realize I'm here to stay or that I am serious about it or that I do genuinely love it and I'm, I have a passion for it and for the right reasons, but it doesn't matter. The point is it has significantly declined. I just had to get through it. Yeah. Um, but I, I do wish I would have taken a break sooner because there's a lot of nights. Uh, it's embarrassing, but it's my truth. There's a lot of nights I've, I would go to bed crying because mm -hmm. it was so painful. It's not embarrassing. It's what it is. is it's, it's sad that people can have that effect on your heart and soul and that they're on their couch and who knows where. Yeah. And we allow them to touch ourselves that way, right? Like, like touch our soul like that. And we give them power over us when they have no, no business having that. You know, that's the hard thing. Like, but we've all been there. Yeah. We've and I, my there. husband used to ask me, he'd be like, why does it get to you so bad? Because he is the total opposite. I mean, and again, we grew up in a small town. He's like, somebody talks crap about you. You just walk up and knock them out. Yeah. <laughs> like, that's how we handle a business. And I'm like, yeah, well, we Got don't. a sandwich? <laughs> we don't have that. <laughs> First of all, I don't think that's always the right answer, yeah. but that's just how he's And then all, a lot of times he's just like, but who really cares? Yeah. It, his whole thought, and I love this. I do. I think this is really important. Um, when you don't even know the people, I don't know the people that are saying the things they do. I mean, I know a few of them and I don't talk to them anymore. Um, but most of the people who run their mouth or who bully you don't know you and you don't know them. Yeah. And their behavior makes me lack any respect for mm -hmm. them. So why do you let someone who you don't respect, like bottom of the barrel, they're as, they're as yeah. low as it gets. Why do you let them impact you? That's his like, I hear it through supporters on social media. I hear it from my husband. I hear it from friends and family. And I'm like, um, I've thought about this a lot because I'm like, am I questioning myself and what I stand for? No, I just had to realize I have really big feelings. Yeah. When I 
I have really high highs and I have really low lows. And I think that's just goes with have, being an emotional human. Like I don't really want to be cold to feeling in something because I'm so, I, I, I feel deeply about things for people. Um, and I don't, I don't really want to change that about myself. Mm -hmm. I want to stay vulnerable. I want to stay transparent about my struggles to feel, to help people feel like they're not alone. Mm -hmm. Because isolation is the thing that'll kill you before anything. Mm. It's to feel like you're on an island. To feel like you don't have, you don't, you're not understood. You Mm -hmm. don't have anybody to lean on. Like, why do you think they put people in prison in a room with, in a cell with no light, no nothing? It's because it's total torture. It's Mm -hmm. punishment. If you can feel that because of you don't feel support around ar- around you then it's dangerous mm-hmm. you know and i don't so i don't want to i don't want to lose that that i think empathy is a superpower it's like my favorite thing i always lean like empathy is a superpower when you want to build relationships and you want to have strong relationships in your life you have to be empathetic and i had to realize that not everybody has that superpower no so that's okay mm-hmm. i just feel very deeply for people and about things yeah. and so i'm gonna have really lo- low lows and i'm gonna have the highest of highs mm-hmm. and it's just like i just that's life right yeah um but i do admire i could probably afford to be a little bit more like him in the sense that like hey to not care yeah i could i could afford to be a little bit more like that yeah, <laughs> yeah. i wish i didn't care you know but i have gotten better um and again they don't hurt me as bad as they do but uh, they as bad as I used to, but it never feels good to be torn down, especially for the things that bring you joy. Yeah. Yeah. And um, I was bullied growing up because I'm a, I'm a redhead, so fair skin, freckles, beautiful. And, and the, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> thank you. Like who? who but okay. I got picked on a lot. You for that. were you were probably picked on because people are jealous. They're like, oh, she's beautiful, and I'm gonna be mean. So it's so it's so funny when when a lot of times when the conversation of bullying gets brought up, um, you hear the word jealousy. Mm-hmm. Uh, when all this first started, whenever like it got really really bad, like in the in the darkest of it, he would always tell me they're just jealous of you, and I'm like, doesn't even make sense. Jealous of what? Yeah. Because I worked my butt off Mm -hmm. because I'm consistent because I'm like, what is there to be jealous of? Do they not know my, they don't, well, they don't know my bad days, right? To pretend that not everybody is struggling behind a screen or even behind this like happy conversation we're having. Mm -hmm. I have demons, you have demons, but to pretend otherwise is so delusional to me and it, it, it irritates me. Mm -hmm. It's like, so we just supposed to go day to day with surface level conversation about the weather, Mm -hmm. slip just slip my wrist like I just I, I don't I don't like that I don't it's not real um it's just I like people who talk about real life yeah. stuff and real life stuff is sometimes ugly mm-hmm. <laughs> so but I don't want to cause that I don't want to ever cause that pain no on other people on other people yeah. but those uh, those of you out there that are watching or listening like just know that if you're experiencing some of these things in your community number one those people aren't your friends mm-hmm. and number two you've and I hate to say this but you've got to just be tough <laughs> you know kind of it gives you keep, thicker skin yeah you've got to put one foot in front of the other and just keep going towards your mission your calling your purpose whatever it is and don't let it slow you down in fact you know sometimes I'll take those things and I'll better myself with them you know and um in some of the criticism that I've gotten Rightfully so. I did suck at some things, and, and because I had it pointed out in a not-so-nice way that I sucked at things, um, it made me get better at them. Sure. Um, and so also, you know, a lot of self-reflection, too, you know, like like for me with my shooting ability with firearms, when I first started hunting with Team Elk, I was on a hunt, and I had a cow elk at 400 yards, and I was like, I can't shoot 400 yards. Like, I did the same thing. I, I'm like, I with can't Archer. do that. And the outfitter at the time was like, "Oh no, you need to shoot this elk." And I was like, "No." Like I, I, they, the herd had just got done running, and they were all stopped, and they were looking at me, and and it was just a bad. Like I was rushed, and it was a bad situation for me. And I told him, I said, "No, I'm not going to do it." And I remember I called Steve, and I was like, "Look, I could have shot an elk last night, but I wasn't comfortable shooting 400 yards. I'm so sorry." And I felt awful because 
this man that I was hunting with was belittling me and berating me and just like hold hold on the top of its back and I'm like but there's other elk around it and I don't know like I wasn't confident right and I didn't do it and I called him and I remembered and he said Christy we support you 100% in everything you do and if this guy is pushing you to do something you're not comfortable with don't do it always be true to yourself and the next day my buddy Jim and I went out without the outfitter on a different piece of land and I shot a cow elk and we got it on camera it was 150 yards I had a calm shot and and it worked out perfect and and I stayed true to myself like no this is I'm not comfortable with this I'm not getting bullied into this and I see that with shooting a lot like a lot. shoot 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 do this do that especially in hunts and you feel pressured and you do it and then you live with regret well because and then if you would have messed up then I, then I would have sucked and they would have talked about me Exactly. You can't. You're damned if you do. Damned if you you're don't. 100%. So I didn't. And then I. And then I took that. And I was like, Look, I had this experience. I lacked some skills. And I went and got better. I got training. And I. I spent. I've, I still train with my firearm. And and you know, I don't want to be a long range shooter, but I want to shoot precisely. Yeah. And I want to know that where I put my reticle and I dial my data, that my bullet's going to go where I want it to go. And have that confidence that when I press the trigger on an animal I've done everything I can to give it the best death possible yeah because you know, that's at the end of the day what we're doing we're harvesting and um, so I got better about it but I was bullied originally like you'll you know, never you start with that you'll never regret not taking that shot but there's a lot of things that could be attached to regret yeah. if you would have taken the yeah. shot and I had I had a similar similar experience on the same hunt when I first heard about you in 2015 yeah. again I didn't know anything I'd never seen an elk before I had one at 50 yards, and he's like, that's a 350 bull. Shoot. Shoot. And you were And I'm like, and use my bubble. I was using a three-pin fixed sight. Yeah. It was like, you know, what came with the bow was a package deal. I had three pins, 20, 30, 40. And 40 was a stretch for me because I grew up hunting whitetail, 30 and under shots. Oh, amen. And so he's like, just shoot, just shoot. And I'm like, I know my bubble will hit 50, but I just learned that two days ago. Yeah, you Like, because one of the guides told me, just use your bubble, see what happens. It's a target. I'm like, okay, that was fun. Not at an animal, and which is so, it, it bothers me now looking back. Like, I was just this young girl that was inexperienced, and you were pressuring me, and you would have never quit talking about it had I wounded it. Because I know I'm, I'm, an, I'm connected to enough outfitters now that I'm like, I hear what y'all say about clients when they make bad shots. But I think it's also. Especially a, people, like, in, in the space. Yeah. Because they can make an example of you. Yeah. But what's so cool, and the, I know you probably know this, but I want to say it for the sake of this recording, is you can look back at that experience and then look at the shots that you take now with confidence that are two, maybe three times longer. Well, I don't know about three times. Well, but no. the point is, the point is, you have a threshold that's beyond yeah. that. I feel the same way with a bow. I've I have shot a, a bull at 60 yards now, twice. I can do it. Do yeah. I love it? No, I always want to get close. I always want to be at 20 and under. Of course you do. But the fact that you can look back and say, yeah, I was there. I wasn't I wasn't ready then, but I am now in the right situation. That's right. Because when I draw back, I can tell you there are times where I've been at full draw at 20 yards and be like, I am shaking way too much to make this shot. And I let down. And then I've been at full draw at 60 yards and be and like, I'm going to smoke this bull. Yeah. But if you don't have the confidence connected behind that trigger in that moment on that animal, mm -hmm. for whatever reason, there's a lot of variables that create confidence in that moment. You go with that. That's right. And I love that you did that. Yeah. I think it's so cool. But I also know how... Um, but you have to have supportive people around you. You do. So when you yeah. have pressure, whether it be social media pressure, bullying, or an outfitter, or a guide, or a spouse, or whatever, yeah. pressuring you... Um, you have to be really, you have to have the confidence to be true to yourself and, and say no. And sometimes that's really hard. It's very hard, especially when you're in a, a vulnerable, like um, you're in like a, a position that people could impact yeah. you easily because yeah. you don't know any better. You don't know what you don't know and you shouldn't feel bad for what mm -hmm. you don't know. Yeah. I, I that's, I keep, t I tell myself, I saw that, heard that on a Joe Rogan podcast and he's like, why do people feel bad about not knowing things? We're not supposed to, we're we're meant to continue yeah. to learn and build and from experiences and other people who do know who are qualified to be teaching that. Um, and so I, I try to extend grace to, to other people and myself. Like 
it's okay to not know some yeah. things and it's okay to take that and be like I would like to know I would like to invest in that area of my life and mm -hmm. grow that and expand and um but you can't have it all and ha you can't have it all right away yeah. or even quickly and how can you appreciate the journey if you didn't if you didn't like accept the fact that it's going to take some yeah. time so um nothing yeah. good happens instantly <laughs> well yeah. sometimes like my dad used to tell me Christy, Ellen, I kind of had to be frustrated. You'd be like, Christy, your, your luck can change in the blink of an eye. So instantly things can change, but it's never instantly that they really change. It just, right. it's the, that moment of time can change, you know. Yeah. But so I would, I would relate that like back to the, the initial intro when we talked about my job with MKC. I would say that the, the moment that I got the text from Josh, mm -hmm. would you ever move to Montana? I would say that was when my life instant, like, instantly changed mm -hmm. blink of an eye it was just one text message yeah. i say the same thing about hunt and full when i shook jared lyle's hand mm -hmm. for the first time i was like that moment changed my life yeah but not immediately no. i didn't move to cedar city till 11 months later yeah it's take gonna take but at the time i got the text to moving to montana it's gonna be a few months like it's never instant yeah but what's your husband gonna do for work when you guys move he'll work remotely for gotcha. hunt and full yeah yeah yeah, and then he guides all in the fall. He's always guiding from August to November, so yeah. he'll stay doing that and see where yeah. the world takes us. Yeah, that's so exciting. It's yeah, I'm excited. It's an incredible journey that you guys are on, and you're going to be closer to me, kind of, I think, maybe about the same distance, actually, but, um, man, Montana's a beautiful country, and, and you're going to love it there. When, I, when you first announced you were leaving, it's interesting. I was like, oh, are you going to work for Elk Foundation? For some reason, I instantly <laughs> thought, like, this is where she's going, and that wasn't the it's funny so between rmef and uh onyx those were the top you were going two, to go. and i'm like y'all are really close it's like you're getting warmer but you're not quite there yeah but, but yeah, all of them they're are all in missoula missoula companies yeah <laughs> so it's funny i was like well i guess that means i was supposed to be in missoula because everybody thought i was going to missoula in the first place yeah i think you're gonna love it there it's a beautiful place and like i said i think you're on the right side of town i wouldn't want to live south of missoula that's the traffic down revere is yeah brutal especially in the morning yeah. um so yeah you're you're gonna be you're gonna love it you're gonna love this new chapter and new journey and you know having just gone through a move at two years post move and i'm still not unpacked so just <laughs> okay. be patient <laughs> no i need to hear that because i just started i just really got truly settled from yeah. moving into my house and that i bought in september yeah. or that we bought um so i know what that's like like don't ever close on a house in the middle of the rut in no. September. I literally closed through my inreach. Oh, no. My realtor, I had to be power of attorney for my for my husband. And then, because I was like, I got to go chase elk. Like, I'm going to sign these early and then leave. And then my realtor was like, okay, I'll finalize everything and get, keep your keys. I'll text you. I'm like, you can't text me, though. And he, she's like, what do you mean? I'm like, inreach. Inreach. What's that? <laughs> so, anyway, it's possible. Anything is That's possible. That's how I sold my house in Oregon is inreach. Yeah. I was hey. texting with inreach on elk um, calling. <laughs> yeah, well, we were deer hunting, but um, still same. Uh, but same thing. Technology really has evolved and allows us to do things in really remote places now. But um, yeah, no, you, you, I'm excited for your journey and what's next for you guys and your married life and uh, Montana this year. And it's gonna be fun following your hunting season. Yeah, be super fun. Uh, where can everybody find you online, social media, if they want to follow you? All, all platforms are at Follow Her Arrow. Yeah, super easy. And um, do you have a website? I, I do. Followherarrow.com. I am about to actually get it all updated with my, you know, last two years of articles. I've been writing articles for a long time, and I just haven't updated it. But I love to write. I've I've been writing again. So it's just, like a blog. Yeah. I just again, I I'm still doing it behind the scenes. Yeah. I'm just it's just not forward facing. But I uh, there's some old stuff on there, and I still I'm still p proud of that content too. Yeah. So well, I. Appreciate all of you at home, listening, streaming, uh, for watching, for tuning in. We are at the Ruger booth, Ruger Marlin booth at Hunt Expo. I want to thank our partners, Ruger Marlin, OnX, SCI, Wilderness Athlete. And I appreciate you, Jessica, for coming and sharing your story. Um, hopefully there's people out there that's got a lot of inspiration from what you spoke about today and kind of coming up and hunting. And I appreciate you taking the time. It's a crazy weekend and you got up early to come to the show and do this with us. So thank you so much. Thank you for the invite. I was just flattered to even get a text message from you. I, so. Well, it's about time I got you on here, but it's like time is so, yeah. you know, we're all so busy. So, uh, we get to see each other at these shows like 
once a year. Yeah. <laughs> and then most of the time you don't even see people. You're like, oh, yeah, that's that person. And then you just, yeah, you're going. So yeah. thank you for making the time. And thank you guys again for joining us. When conditions get tough on a mountain hunt, your gear must be tougher. Making every opportunity count means selecting equipment that will not fail. Any condition, anywhere, Hornady Outfitter ammunition is designed to perform. Available in a wide range of cartridges from 243 to 375 Ruger. When you're looking for a hard hitting, deep penetrating bullet and cartridge that performs in the most rugged environments, look no further than Hornady Outfitter ammunition. Thank you for listening to the Wild and Uncut podcast. If you would like to hear more, be sure to subscribe to my Pursue the Wild digital series on YouTube and follow me at Christy Titus on Facebook and Instagram.